Introducing the ultimate voiceover tool for professionals and amateurs, a powerful and easy-to-use software that lets you easily create high-quality voiceovers. Kaba is well known for its sacredness and religious importance. But recently, strange phenomena keep happening like violent sandstorms and unexpected floods that covered the Kaaba in water. And there was also a weird sound that came from the Kaaba, like a loud humming or buzzing noise. Are these events just natural phenomena, or do they signify something more spiritual and supernatural? Are they signs from God, or are they something else? Join us on this captivating journey. We'll delve into the recent events unfolding in Mecca, Saudi Arabia. Body. A powerful storm hit the city, where the Kaaba, the most holy place in Islam, is located. It brought heavy rain and strong wind, and even lightning struck the clock tower near the Kaaba. The storm caused chaos and fear among the people, who were moved by this rare and amazing event. Many people wondered what this event meant, as the sun was going down, the sky turned dark and the wind started to blow. The people, who were there to worship at the Grand Mosque, saw the stars disappear behind the clouds. The wind was so strong that it stopped people from doing anything outside, and it even damaged some buildings. But in the center of the Grand Mosque, the Kaaba, the most sacred place in Islam, was still and calm, as if nothing could shake its faith. A huge storm hit the city, where thousands of pilgrims were there to perform Umrah, a lesser pilgrimage in Islam. The storm brought heavy rain, strong wind, and even lightning that struck the clock tower near the Kaaba, the most sacred place in Islam. The storm was so rare and severe that a meteorologist from the authorities said it was highly unusual for Mecca to have such weather at this time of the year. But the people of Mecca did not lose their faith or their courage. They were protected by the emergency services, who acted quickly and efficiently to ensure their safety. They also shared their experiences on social media, posting pictures and videos of the city soaked in rain, with the Kaaba standing firm and unscathed in the background. The sight of the holy building covered in raindrops, but still intact, was a powerful message to have faith and perseverance. They continued their worship, and they walked around the Kaaba. The moment they showed their faith and their loyalty to God. While the city recovers from the storm, the authorities are working hard to clean up the mess and to watch out for the weather, in case something else happens. The Kaaba, which is the focus of the prayers of millions of Muslims every day, stands as a sign of hope and courage in the face of nature's power. Until now, have you ever wondered what storms mean in the Bible? Storms are not just natural events but they are also rich symbols that reveal many truths about God and us. In the Bible, storms are often used to show God's messages, our feelings, and our changes. They often show how great and strong God is, and how He rules over everything He made and can do anything He wants. But what does this storm in Mecca have to do with us as Christians? Well, the Bible tells us that, before Jesus comes back, there will be signs and wonders in the sky and on the earth. There will be natural disasters, wars, famines, diseases, and persecution. There will be false prophets, false messiahs, and false religions. There will be deception, apostasy, and lawlessness. There will be a great tribulation, a great battle, and a great antichrist. These things will happen to test the faith of God's people and to warn the world of God's coming judgment. For example, in the book of Exodus, God sent a series of plagues on Egypt, including hail, thunder, and lightning to demonstrate his power and judgment over Pharaoh and his gods. Exodus. In the book of Job, God spoke to Job out of a storm, to challenge his complaints, and to remind him of his sovereignty and wisdom. Job. 134. In the book of Psalms, the psalmists often describe their emotions and situations using storm imagery, such as being in a raging sea, being swept away by a flood, or being struck by lightning. Psalm 18, 4-19, 29, sir, minus 11. 69, or minus 2, or being 7, 16, minus 20. In the book of Jonah, God sent a great wind and a violent storm to stop Jonah from running away from his mission, and to teach him a lesson about his mercy and compassion. Jonah 1, 4, minus 17, 4, 4, 5, minus 11. In the book of Matthew, Jesus calmed a storm on the Sea of Galilee to show his disciples his authority and faithfulness and to increase their faith and trust in him. Matthew 8, 23, minus 27. These are just some of the examples of how storms are used in the Bible to convey different meanings and messages. Storms can be scary and destructive, but they can also be awe-inspiring and transformative. 
They can show us who God is and who we are. They can challenge us, comfort us, and change us. But these things will also happen to prepare the way for Jesus' return. The Bible tells us that after the tribulation, Jesus will come back in glory and power. He will come with his angels and with his saints. He will come with a loud trumpet and with a bright cloud. He will come to judge the living and the dead and to reward his faithful followers. He will come to destroy his enemies and to establish his kingdom. He will come to make all things new and to reign forever. So, what do you think about this? Is Jesus coming soon? The second coming of Christ will be the most amazing and wonderful event ever. It will be the final result of what Jesus did for us by dying on the cross and rising from the dead. He did this to save us from our sins and to give us eternal life. But how can we know that Jesus' second coming is certain? And how can we be ready for it? How do we know that Jesus is coming back? Because the Bible tells us so. The Bible tells us that Jesus came to the earth as a baby, lived a perfect life, helped people, and died for our sins. He did this to save us and to give us a new life with Him. The Bible also tells us that Jesus will come back again, and it will be the most amazing and wonderful event ever. It will be something that everyone will see and feel. But when will this happen? And why doesn't God tell us the exact time, not even the angels? Well, the Bible tells us that the time is not as important as the event and the reason. The time is a secret, but the event and the reason are clear. The Bible tells us that while we wait for Jesus to come back, we should love others, serve others, and lead others to Him. This is our calling as Christians, and this is what pleases God. The Bible also tells us that God has not revealed everything to us, and that some things are hidden from us. This is because God knows what we need to know, and what we don't need to know. Some things are not essential for our salvation, or for our spiritual growth. God wants us to trust Him, and to focus on what He has revealed to us. The Bible also tells us that Jesus is coming soon. The word soon means that it could happen at any time, and that we should always be ready. The Bible also uses the word imminent, which means the same thing. The second coming of Christ is imminent, meaning that nothing else has to happen before He comes. All the prophecies that need to be fulfilled have been fulfilled, and all the signs that need to be shown have been shown. The only thing that is left is for Jesus to come. But not all Christians agree on the details of the second coming of Christ. Some Christians have different views on how and when Jesus will come, and what will happen before and after He comes. These views are based on different interpretations of the Bible, and different ways of understanding the end times. One of the main differences is between dispensationalism and non-dispensationalism. Dispensationalism is a view that divides history into different periods or dispensations, each with a different way of God dealing with His people. Non-dispensationalism is a view that does not divide history into different periods, but sees God's plan as one continuous story. Another difference is between pre-tribulation and post-tribulation views of the rapture. The rapture is a term that refers to the event when Jesus will take His believers to heaven before the tribulation, which is a period of great suffering and evil on earth. Pre-tribulation is a view that believes that the rapture will happen before the tribulation and that the believers will be spared from it. Post-tribulation is a view that believes that the rapture will happen after the tribulation and that the believers will go through it. These are some of the differences that exist among Christians about the second coming of Christ, but these differences should not divide us or distract us from the main point. The main point is that Jesus is coming back and that we should be ready for Him. Jesus Himself taught us this when He spoke about His return to His disciples. He told them that no one knows the exact time or date of His coming, not even the angels or Himself, but only the Father. He told them to watch and pray and to be alert and faithful. He told them to be like servants who are waiting for their master to return, or like brides who are waiting for their bridegroom to come. He told them to be like wise virgins who have oil in their lamps, or like faithful stewards who manage their master's property well. He told them to be ready, or he will come like a thief in the night, or like lightning that flashes across the sky. This is what the Bible tells us about the second coming of Christ. It tells us that he is coming soon, and that he is coming for us. It tells us that He is coming to judge the world and to reward His people. It tells us that He is coming to make all things new and to reign forever. It tells us that He is coming to fulfill His promise and to complete His work. It tells us that He is coming to be with us and to love us. God does not want us to know everything, but He wants us to trust Him and His plans.
The Bible tells us that Jesus is coming soon and that we should be excited for it. James tells us to be patient and strong because the Lord is near. Revelation tells us that the time is near. Jesus tells us to watch for him and to be ready for him. He says, You also must be ready because the Son of Man will come at an hour when you do not expect him. Luke 12:40. This means that Jesus could come at any time and that we should always be prepared for him. So, what's the difference between the second coming of Christ and the rapture of the church? The second coming of Christ is when he will come back to the earth and he will fight his enemies and start his kingdom. This will not happen until after some other things happen, like the tribulation, which is a time of trouble and pain for the world. So, the second coming of Christ is not coming soon, but the rapture of the church is when Jesus will take his believers to heaven before the tribulation. The rapture could happen any time, and it is coming soon. Our long-awaited salvation is poised for revelation. The imminent return of Jesus to gather his followers could unfold at any moment, initiating the events foretold in Revelation. Just as the wise virgins in Jesus' parable, we must remain vigilant and prepared, as the exact timing remains unknown. Matthew 25 In readiness for this impending upheaval, we must make comprehensive preparations, mentally, spiritually, and physically. God's desire is to offer salvation both individually and collectively to nations, contingent upon our repentance and wholehearted dedication to Him. While I hold faith in the salvation of my nation, America, current indicators suggest it may come through the crucible of judgment and truth. Despite God's mercy, our collective rejection of Him and the accumulation of national sins have provoked divine indignation. Consequently, we confront escalating judgments until genuine repentance occurs and sparks revival within the church thereby influencing the broader society. True revival in America hinges upon individual spiritual renewal among Christians. Having forsaken God's goodness as a nation, we now confront the increasing severity of divine judgment due to our rebellion, unbelief, and disregard for godly principles. As we reap the consequences of our actions, we are reminded of the prophet Jeremiah's words, Your own wickedness shall chasten and correct you. You have forsaken the Lord your God. The fear of me is not in you, declares the Lord of hosts, Jeremiah. God's will amidst these impending judgments is clear. His people shall be saved, shielded, and empowered to manifest His kingdom across the globe. However, for this divine plan to unfold, wholehearted return to God's ways is imperative. The present hour calls for the church to awaken and radiate its light, for it is through us that God intends to usher in revival. My prayer is that the storm of judgment looming over America transforms into a vehicle for restoration and redemption, rather than leading to utter devastation. I beseech that the overcomers emerge, guiding the church towards holiness, righteousness, and triumph. In this crucial hour, worldly pursuits and indifference find no place among the overcomers. May the Lord extend His mercy amidst the impending storm of judgment upon our nation and the world. Let us prepare the path for the Lord's coming. Come, Lord Jesus, and deliver your people. It's never too late to surrender to God. He will rescue and employ you in his grand end-time work, a testament to his power and glory. Through his bride and remnant, God intends to showcase his perfect work amidst the tumultuous events of the... On the third day, as dawn broke, the mountain was enveloped in thunder, lightning, and a dense cloud accompanied by a resounding trumpet blast that filled the camp with awe. Guided by Moses, the people ventured forth to encounter God, standing humbly at the mountain's base. Mount Sinai was shrouded in smoke as the Lord descended upon it in flames, causing the entire peak to quake violently. The trumpet's reverberations grew ever louder, and as Moses spoke, the voice of God responded, Exodus. In this moment, God prepared to impart His law to His chosen people setting the Israelites apart from the surrounding nations through sanctification. Throughout Scripture, storms often symbolize the awe-inspiring power and presence of God. With darkness, lightning, thunder, earthquakes, and fire serving as manifestations of His magnificence, the divine manifestation atop Mount Sinai not only revealed God's holiness, power, and purity, but also underscored the necessity of maintaining a clear separation between God and sin. The profound experience of witnessing the storm combined with rituals such as washing their garments and maintaining a respectful distance from the mountain, left an indelible impression on the Israelites regarding their own sinfulness and God's transcendent holiness. 
Both the Israelites and Moses trembled in awe and reverence, recognizing the fear of the Lord as the foundation of true knowledge. Only by revering God and obediently following His commands could they fulfill their destiny as His holy nation and partake in the privileges of serving as a kingdom of priests. How do we interpret it all? Crucially, God maintained sovereignty over the weather. In part, this means that adverse weather, destructive in nature, only occurs with His allowance. Yet, it also underscores that weather is an inherent part of the natural order, with adverse conditions stemming from the consequences of the fall. Therefore, we need not attribute specific judgment to every storm that arises. Additionally, a theological implication emerges. If God controls the weather, then no other deity does. In ancient Near Eastern cultures, various gods were linked to weather phenomena, such as Baal, the storm god, known as Captain Bud Bear in the Old Testament, and regarded as the chief deity by many of Israel's neighbors. Through his mastery over weather, particularly as foretold by his prophets. God aimed to dissuade his people from pursuing foreign gods. Consider the account of Samuel and Saul, where a storm served as a reminder of the futility of human kingship compared to God's supremacy. Now, regarding Satan's power, does he possess any? While he may request permission from God to unleash calamities, it's evident that any authority granted to him is ultimately at God's discretion. Thus, there's no evidence to support Satan's dominion over weather phenomena. Furthermore, although experiencing adverse weather doesn't always equate to divine punishment for specific sins, God can employ weather to discipline the wicked or shield the righteous. While such interventions are documented, there remain exceptions, akin to miracles, rather than the norm. The reality of encountering adverse weather is an inherent aspect of our existence as fallen beings residing in a fractured world. Just as God doesn't discriminate in sending rain upon both the righteous and the wicked, so too does he permit tornadoes to affect all indiscriminately. Consider carefully what defines bad weather. It's the destruction it brings, a consequence often influenced by human habitation and technological advancements. Reflect on the parable of the two foundations. While a storm may cause one house to collapse, it's the quality of construction that ultimately seals its fate. For a well-built house, a storm is merely another passing event. However, it's worth noting that in the Old Testament, Catastrophic weather was often viewed as a manifestation of divine judgment due to its destructive potential, instilling fear and highlighting humanity's lack of control over such n Yet, there's a crucial distinction between this perspective and how modern sermons often interpret sheltering in storms. For the ancients, God's sovereignty over storms was acknowledged, with such events viewed either as consequences of sin or as part of divine discipline and testing. Rarely was a storm equated with chaos as we perceive it today. Indeed, Jesus calmed storms and ensured the disciples' safety. But it's important to note the context. They traversed the Sea of Galilee, prone to frequent storms due to geographical factors. Thus, it's challenging to draw broad theological conclusions from such commonplace occurrences. Furthermore, Jesus' mastery over the storm wasn't merely about ensuring their safety. It served as a demonstration of his divine authority. When listening to sermons on this topic, consider their underlying implications. Are you prepared for his return? Remain vigilant. As highlighted in Luke, Jesus emphasized readiness, urging his disciples, and by extension, us, to prioritize spiritual treasure over earthly wealth. We gleaned profound insights from his teachings. He emphasized the correlation between our treasure's location and the orientation of our hearts. If our treasure lies in earthly pursuits, we're inclined to amass wealth and possessions here. While some tout money as power, for many, it's seen as the pathway to happiness. However, with an eternal perspective centered on God, our focus shifts to accumulating heavenly treasure, recognizing that our ultimate destiny transcends earthly confines. It rests with God in heaven. Given this perspective, shouldn't we eagerly anticipate Christ's return, His second coming? This is the essence of his subsequent parable. Stay dressed for action. Keep your lamps burning. We're urged not to be caught half-prepared or cloaked in darkness, but to remain consistently ready. But ready for what? Precisely. We're called to readiness for action, symbolized by keeping our lamps alight. The lamp Jesus speaks of isn't a modern electric light or flashlight. It's an ancient oil lamp with a wick. When lit, it illuminates the surroundings, guiding people on their path and aiding them in their tasks. Similarly, our readiness, our spiritual vigilance, 
is akin to keeping our lamps burning, providing light amidst darkness, ensuring clarity and guidance in our journey of faith. In reflecting upon the myriad teachings shared in this discourse, one truth emerges resoundingly clear. Our faith journey is intricately intertwined with the elements of preparation, vigilance, and steadfast dedication to God's will. From the awe-inspiring manifestations atop Mount Sinai to the profound insights drawn from Christ's parables, we are reminded of the eternal significance of our choices and the importance of aligning our hearts with heavenly treasure. As we navigate the storms of life, whether metaphorical or literal, we are called not to succumb to fear or uncertainty, but to stand firm in our trust in God's sovereignty. Just as the ancient lamp illuminated the path for travelers, our faith serves as a beacon of hope amidst the darkness, guiding us toward the fulfillment of God's purpose in our lives. Therefore, let us heed the call to readiness, to keep our lamps burning brightly with the oil of faith, love, and righteousness. Let us anticipate with eager hearts the glorious return of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, knowing that in His presence lies the fulfillment of all our hopes and the realization of our eternal death. May we, as individuals and as a community of believers, continue to strive for holiness, righteousness, and unwavering devotion to God, trusting in His unfailing love and provision. And may our journey through life be marked by the light of His truth, guiding us ever closer to the glorious culmination of His divine plan. Amen.